is uh, insists that I have hearing loss and wants me to get checked out. I told her, <clears throat> I mean, there's only one hearing aid I'd even consider. It's very high tech, it's very expensive, but I said, don't worry about it because I don't need it. She said, what kind is it? I said, 7.30. <laughs> little hearing joke for you. So when I'm not running live sound, I'm in a recording studio usually helping um, people get uh, music out of their head and into their iPod and phone and CD and wherever. And um, You know, on the rare occasion I speak in public, I always mention that I'm used to looking at the back of heads, not the front. It's very, very unusual, but it's very exciting in a, in a terrifying kind of way. So, so anyway, you know, when you're working on song structure, there's a typical form that goes like this, intro, right? You're bringing people in, kind of giving them, setting the tone. And then there's usually a first verse. But all songs point to the chorus. If you're into songwriting, you know that. The, the chorus is the payoff, it's the, it's the hook, it's the big idea. And you know, when you're speaking, it's, it's not real different. I'm gonna give you the chorus ahead of time tonight of what I'm gonna talk about. Hopefully it's on the slide. We got it? And I'd love you to say this with me, okay? Here's the big idea. God's ways are not our ways. Good. As a matter of fact, God tells us this. This is from Isaiah. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. So when we say they're not like our ways, they are way above. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So hold that thought, we're gonna come back to it. But here, here's the first verse, I call this a tale of two emails. So I get in a lot of talks in the studio, you can imagine musicians, they're very philosophical and artsy and a lot of times they go in a spiritual direction and I was having a conversation like that earlier this year with a, a guy and his girlfriend, we're gonna call them Jack and Jill, <clears throat> not their real names, but the rest of this is all true. So we're talking and you know, I'm just kind of telling them my story that, you know, how good I have found God to be. And then uh, we're walking out, to, he's getting ready to get in his car and he turns and he says, I just have one question. If there's a God, why does he allow all this evil to exist? You know, the classic question, great question. So, I'm looking at Jack and I'm thinking, well, this isn't gonna be a two, I said, that's a great question. Let me get back to you, because I'm not just gonna go, hey Jack, God's ways aren't like our ways, so get with it. It's not gonna be a two sentence answer, it's gonna require some thought. So, but in the meantime, you know, I like to ride my bike in the morning and ride down to this train station where I just like to clear my head out. And usually I have a few minutes to pray. And so I kind of put him and Jill on my prayer list. Like, Lord, that was cool. Um, in the meantime, Lord, draw them to you. I don't know where this is going or where it came from and put other people on their path. And Lord, make, remind me to get on this and, and I'll send them an email. So I was pretty faithful in prayer. I wasn't so faithful about getting back to him with the email, and weeks turned into months, and as I'm praying, I'm like, Lord, I gotta help me to get this done. This is important. Meanwhile, he's coming back to the studio to pick up some CDs, so I thought, well, I'm gonna make it a point to tell him, listen, I have not forgotten, and um, I really wanna talk to you more about this. They walk in the door, first thing Jill says, and it's been months, <clears throat> you know, we're still waiting for the answer to our question. I was shocked, because I didn't think they even thought anything about it. I wasn't sure, I sure did. But my heart was kind of jumping up and down like, wow, really? And also conviction was really growing now like, okay, I gotta get back to them. So within a few days, I sat down and I crafted a, um, a very long email. And um, uh, yeah, I had my testimony in there and I had a disclaimer that like, listen, I, I'm not the Bible answer man. I, I fully trust a God I don't fully understand. And that's one of my if you get to know me, that's one of the things you'll probably hear me say, you know, because I know that God's ways are not our ways. I, I talked about the, uh, did I bring my seltzer up here? If anybody wants to deliver it, I'd love it. Um, that's another story. I have a whole testimony about seltzer water. Some of you might have heard it. Yeah. It's so busy. Wait, listen, listen. Hello. 
It's a little flat. All right. But I love the bubbles. All right, where was I? So, God's, I'm talking about God's infinite character and his qualities versus our finite minds. You know, how we can't grasp infinity or eternity and, and yet, you know, time must either never stop or must stop and how could you imagine either one? Things like that and I, of course, I invoked the F word, right? I said, you know, this, at some point it's faith. You, you've got to, hey, hey now. It's faith at some point, right? If this was a cut and dried thing, there wouldn't be anything to discuss, would it? It'd be like the sun's in the sky when the sun went down. I said, you know, at some point you've got to, you jump in and you say, I'm in. My heart convinces me that my conscience tells me I'm, I'm messed up, I'm sick, and I, I need a savior. Right? So it was all that. Anyway, I had YouTube videos, clips of <coughs> people's, pardon me, testimonies. I had a link to a song <coughs> a friend of mine wrote when he was dying. It was pretty good. So within 24 hours, I got an answer back in my, my mailbox. <coughs> and uh, I excitedly opened it. And uh, here's how it started. <coughs> John, Jill is crying and I'm a bit numb. I'm like, yes. <laughs> First of all, I'm adding your friend to the St. Jude kids, blah, blah, blah. Secondly, your comments are not totally foreign to me, even, even as an Episcopalian. Now, Jill, on the other hand, is Catholic and understands the guilt side better than I. <clears throat> I knew this was going left. That said, you should know, I have been squeaky clean my whole life so Jesus could be proud of me. And this is where you, right? We're both very flattered you took the time, blah, 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 all the best, Jack. So <clears throat> let me repeat that. You should know I have been squeaky clean my whole life so Jesus could be proud of me. Now, does that remind you of a story in the Bible at all? Anybody? Remember the, the rich young ruler? All right? Let me re, re, refresh your memory or, or tell it to you if you haven't heard it. So th this dude comes to Jesus. He's rich. Apparently he's young. <clears throat> and he says, good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And the first thing Jesus says is, well, why do you call me good? You know, he was right. He was good. But Jesus is trying to make him think, you know, other, other than God who's good. But back to your question. He says, well, you know the commandments. You know, don't murder don't lie, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and the guy goes, check, done it all. I did all those things since I was a little kid. <clears throat> now, first of all, we all know he's lying, right? Or, or just really self-deceived. We'll give him maybe a little, a little credit there that he didn't mean to lie, he just really believed that. So, you know, first of all, if I was Jesus, I can be a little sarcastic, so I, I'd, it'd be hard to miss a chance to wreck this guy. I'd be like, hold on a second, <clears throat> no correct scripture, all have not uh, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we missed a guy. <laughs> or, uh, hold on a second, ding, 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 we got a winner, Dad, we got a guy, we missed him. Johnny, tell him what, tell him what he's won. Well, Jesus, he's won a mansion in the best neighborhood in heaven and dinner with you and your father every night for eternity. But I just think stuff like that. Jesus didn't do that, though. <clears throat> Here's what he does. You guys remember what he says? He goes, okay, one more thing. Sell all your stuff and come follow me. And the end of the story is that this guy walks away very sadly because he couldn't do it. Now... Do you think Jesus has it in for rich people? I don't think so. Money can be a scary thing, but, you know, talk to any missionary. They'll tell you, generous rich people are an important part of the body of Christ. We need people like that. So, you know, I think if the guy was afraid of heights, maybe he would have said, hey, just climb that 50-foot ladder and come back down and <clears throat> you'll be done. But he knew the guy, he wanted to give him something he couldn't do. So, you know, like the rich young ruler, Jack didn't realize that, you have my slide, God's ways are, with me, not our ways. Wow, that was lonely. Let's do it again. 
God's ways are not our ways. Right. All right. Email number two. So there's Jack and Jill. This was another person who had asked for prayer. And um, in this email was recounting all these problems. Problems at work, health problems, financial problems. It's just, you know, overwhelming problems. But here's the one thing that jumped out at me in this email that made me want to get back quickly. It's, it says, uh, and I quote, I'm in need of a, of a miracle, but feel unworthy to ask for one. And when I read that, you know, here's another person who's got a, a flawed view of God, right? You know, it, it, it just made me very sad because I feel like you're so close. You're right. You need a miracle. But you've put yourself in this, in this jail. And the door's not locked. And you just don't know it. You know, that's how I see <clears throat> someone who thinks that, that way. And normally, when, you know, I'm sharing stuff with people, I just like to give them scripture and get out of the way. Because I know, like, God says, deep calls to deep. He says his word won't return empty and void. And I find I have just, you know, it works out best when I just share God's word with them and, and minimize my, my yakking. So, so here was my... My quick response, here's a little excerpt. Thanks for your transparency. I know uh, I can relate to worry that piles up and can feel overwhelming. And I just want to pick up on one thing you said, and I repeated, you know, I'm in need of a miracle, and, but feel unworthy to ask for one. And I said, you know, I believe the enemy of our soul loves when we think that way. Why? Because none of us will ever be worthy to ask God for anything. That's what's so mind-blowing about him. He loves when we come to him humbly, desperately, and yes, unworthy. <clears throat> so, now I didn't just make that stuff up. A few years back, I was in a similar state where I was, um, you know, just have one of those valley periods where you're just, you know, you, you're just in a, a desert place spiritually. You're getting up and you're... You're grinding out another day, and you're like, you know, I, I know I'm saved. I guess I'm saved, but I'm not really experiencing God. And anybody? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And so, you know, that can kind of spiral. You know, then you don't really feel like reading the Word, and the less you feel like reading the Word, the less you remember how good God is, and you can start making up stuff about Him. It's just not good. And so, so I, ha I, I could identify with worry, with, with anxiety, with depression, with guilt over things that, like, am I ever going to get past this? Yeah. Stuff like that. So <clears throat> someone came alongside me and, and kind of mentored me and, and, and helped me really to get past myself and see God for who he really is and understand his character. Now, this person was far from perfect himself. As a matter of fact, I knew that he had had an affair with another man's wife. True story. Not only that, it's crazier. <clears throat> he, he put out a hit on her husband because she was pregnant by him. Now, if you haven't figured out where I'm going with this yet, that man's name was David and he wrote the book of Psalms in the Bible. And I'm not talking just about David of David and Goliath, David uh, the shepherd boy who killed a lion and a bear with his bare, bare hands, David who killed tens of thousands of Philistines, <clears throat> great warrior, and then became king, but also David the adulterer and murderer. And if you haven't heard that story, here's a quick synopsis. While he's king of Israel, and the Bible says that in the spring when kings go to war, well, David sent his... Uh, he sent his army and his generals, but he decided to just kick back at the palace and do nothing, which is not a good idea. You ever heard that proverb, you know, idle hands are the devil's workshop? Well, so then he's out <clears throat> on, his, on his terrace and can overlook the rooftops of other houses and sees this beautiful woman bathing, is overcome by lust, has his men bring her to the palace, commits adultery with her, gets her pregnant, so now he's in big trouble because the husband's been away at war. So David has him come back for a little furlough um, and have him, um, uh, he wants him to spend the weekend with his, uh, with his wife, Uriah, right? His name is Uriah. 
So David brings him back and, and invites him to the palace. And how's things going? Have a great meal with me. You're doing a great job. And go home, sleep with your wife. He won't do it. David tries. He, next night he brings him again, gets him loaded on wine, tells him go home and sleep with your wife. He's like, I can't do that. He, he said the, you know, the ark of the covenant is in a tent. My comrades are at war. I would never do that. Imagine what a schmuck David feels like now. You think, well, oh, that makes one of us. So that doesn't work. So now what's he going to do? Well, he tells his generals, hey, send that guy to the front, <clears throat> pull back, and make sure his life ends. He murders him. And yet, God calls David a man after my own heart. That's how God looked at this man. How could that be? I mean, can you imagine if you had to nominate somebody for a person of the year, Christian of the year, you know, and uh, like, hey, how about this guy, huh? I mean, I don't even have to ask, but I will. What do you think of this guy? And he did uh, commit adultery and, uh, and had the husband murdered by the person he was committing adultery with. But anything else? Yeah, he was a terrible father. His kids ran wild, one of them tried to kill him. You'd be laughed out of the room, right? Who would nominate someone like that? Yet God calls David a man after his own heart. So can we agree that it wasn't performance-based? Right. So, <clears throat> I mean, this was Ten Commandments stuff, right? God didn't call him the Ten Suggestions. He didn't say, hey, here's ten really good ideas. Think them over. There are commandments. I think there were three things that David really got right. And the first one is, this is my second slide. I can't see him. Oh, there we go. First thing is, David was humble before God. And let's look at his response in Psalm 51. He wrote that after this whole incident happened. Here's how he starts out. Have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. Do you see the humility there? Notice what David doesn't do. He doesn't go, hey, um, don't forget Goliath. <clears throat> and it was those tens of thousands of Philistines. Right? That would be maybe a normal temptation. He doesn't blame Bathsheba. Lord, I, you've seen her. I'm just a man. He doesn't blame God. Say, why did you let her be out there at that very moment? Like Adam did, right? Blame the woman. No, he was humble. And, you know, it reminds me of a verse. You guys know this verse? See if you can fill in the blank. God resists the proud. proud. Very good. I always picture him like this when God's resisting something. Wouldn't that be the most horrible thing in the world to come to God and have him go like this? But gives grace to who? The humble. I love to think about what Scripture doesn't say sometimes. It doesn't say God resist sinners. Thank God for that, right? Who would be left? It tells us in, in uh, Psalm 130, if you kept a record of sins, who could stand? The psalmist says. And it doesn't say he gives grace to people who don't screw up or at least try really hard and, you know, hit a 70% mark. No. The humble. And, and that was the first thing that I think David really got right with God. The second thing David got right with God was that he got real with God. And that's what I love about David when I, when I read the Psalms. You know, he, here's the next part of, his, uh, of Psalm 51. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what's evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner... Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me, but you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. So you see, David owns it. He doesn't sugarcoat things. He says, you will be proved right in what you say. He said, I've done evil in your sight. A little later on, he says, don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Don't banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. 
You notice David doesn't do anything. He doesn't promise to do anything. He doesn't go, hey, listen, <clears throat> I'm, I got a clean slate. Watch me go. Just let this go, please, and I'm going to do better. He, here's what he brings to the table. Sorrow, brokenness, a contrite heart. And it's not that he's lazy. He just goes, God, I can't, I, I can't do it. But I trust you. You can do it. Would you do this in me? Would you make me willing to obey you? Would you create in me a clean heart? Because I know you can do that. And I'm trusting you. And that was the third thing that I think David really got right, was that David trusted God. From when he was a little kid, all the highs in his life and the lows, he trusted God and he he trusted his mercy in his life, not David's performance. And that's what I really want to bring to you tonight. Um, you know, when it comes to trust, I think when it comes to talking about trusting God, nobody has better street cred than David. Because if you read his writings a lot of time, and the stories about him, half the time he was on the run hiding from enemies that were trying to kill him. <clears throat> Listen to Psalm 3. It says this is... Uh, regarding at the time he fled from his son Absalom, who had a bunch of men who were trying to kill David so he could take the throne. Here's how he starts out. Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many are saying God will never rescue him. But you, oh, you see, he's being real, right? He's like, this is what's happening and it's really bad. Verse 3, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me. You are my glory, the one who holds my head high. You see how he's flipping it down? Now he's like, I'm looking this way, horizontally. Here's what's happening. Now I'm looking up. You are my, I cried out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. I'm not afraid of 10,000 armies who surround me on every side. So this dude took a nap probably in a cave somewhere while all this was going on because he just prayed and he trusted God that you've got me and whatever you've got for me, it's okay. And the Psalms are replete with dozens of instances of David either declaring how he's trusting God and God alone, not his chariots, not his horses, not all the skills God's given him, <clears throat> or God talking through David and saying, listen, my people, trust me. Trust me all the time. And I know because I have every one of them highlighted and the reason I have every one of them highlighted is because, you know, when I started digging into the Psalms, <clears throat> I started to realize two things. I think when God repeats himself, it's important, right? So when he keeps saying, this must be important. And the other thing was, you know, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I'm not doing that. You know, I was... Um, you know, when you have a lot of worry... Worry and, and, and fear versus trusting God, they're kind of mutually exclusive, right? The more you do one, the more you're going to push the other one out of your life. And so, <clears throat> you know, I started out reading the Psalms, and then I began to pray the Psalms along with David. It was like he was teaching me, and as God was saying, follow David, this is how you come to me. And then I began to preach the Psalms to myself. I would read stuff and say, do you hear that, soul? David did that himself in Psalm 43 and 44, the one that starts with, as the deer pants for the water. Three different times he says, oh my soul, why are you downcast? And he starts reminding himself all the times God's come through for him. Beautiful stuff. So I really needed that, and I've become, um, he's helped me to remember God's character and how much God's not like me. And to get past myself when I'm discouraged, you know, and, and remember that, God's not like me. His ways are far above my ways. I can be disgusted with myself one day based on my performance, but he's not like that. They will and forget simple things about God. You know, I think there's a reason Jesus called himself the bread of life, the living water. You know, so you saw these food references. Because what's the funny thing about food? You can eat all you want one day. You're going to be hungry and need to eat again the next, right? Although I think I did literally go 24 hours one time because I ate so much food, but you get the point. You don't, you don't eat a bunch on Sundays. And man, I'm going to be busy this week. I'm not going to eat again until Sunday. God wants us to think of him like that. We need to go back to his table daily and get fed and get encouraged and drink from the living water and remember who he is first for ourselves. And then so we can go out 
and boast about him in a very natural way to other people. You know, I'll tell you what my Christian Christian testimony is these days. And, and, and you know, again, I'm running in all these musicians, and hopefully, I do a good job for, them for this in the studio. And then we just start talking, and I say, "Listen, I don't know what you think about Christianity, but here's my story. I'm a hot mess who desperately needs a savior, and my God is merciful and kind and patient with me, and keeps encouraging me, and doesn't keep a record of." I mess up, he just wants me to, to follow him and trust him. And I've learned a few things from this guy, David. And that, that's my story. And I just tell him, you know, God's maybe not who you think he is. And there's a lot about him we don't understand, but one of them is, is love. You know, sure we can go, you know, oh gosh, he's infinite, he's eternal, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent. Yeah, but he's also love, right? The Bible says he is love. I believe he's love like the sun is hot. Like, this is my personal opinion. We couldn't handle it right now down here that one day in heaven we'll see him in all his glory. But when we get little glimpse, glimpses, I mean, it can undo us when we just ponder his great mercy. And that's why I find that so important in the morning. So I, I, did, I meant to bring my phone up here in time myself, but if the worship team's around, you guys can probably start making your way. I just want to ask all of you young people here, and please, please be real. Do you, do you know this God? I know you know about him, but do you know him? Do you know him like that? Have you pondered his great mercy and kindness? Have you thought about that lately? Have you thought about it? One of my pastors said one time, you know, if I were God, I would have slayed me by now. I would have vaporized me. And it's true. You know, when I go through the Lord's Prayer, and I'm alone, so it's not our Father, it's just me, it's Dad. And, and when I when I go through, you know, Forgive us our trespasses. What I, I like to quote David. Here's how David put it. He said, forgive me for my many, many sins. Too numerous to count. Think about that. I'm, I'm old, so I got, a, I got a big trail, a big pile. I go way back. And I'm still here. And you know, sometimes I tell God, if I could never pay you back if I had a trillion lifetimes for your kindness, your mercy, your patience, your salvation, your forgiveness in my life, but help me to pay it forward. And then when you read the next part, right, as we forgive those who sin against us, maybe some of you struggle with forgiveness. It's not always easy for me, but you know what? It's a lot easier when instead of going, hey, I gotta suck it up and forgive this person. You could, no, let me just ponder God's forgiveness to me for a moment. And really stay there. And then go, okay, Lord, it's embarrassing how hard I have to work at this sometimes, but thank you. Thank you for reminding me once again. So, another thing I tell him is, Lord, I need you desperately today to think, to say, to do any good thing. Because even if I don't understand what's happening, this, I don't care if it's about to be the best day of my life or the worst. One thing is, remains, I still need you desperately. So I hope that you can settle that in your mind, maybe this week. Make some extra time to get with God and, and remember that God is for you and that you need Him desperately. With that will come a joy and a peace that you can't buy with all the gold in the world. You pray with me? Let me end in prayer and then we can, we can go out with a song. Lord, thank you for the life of David. I thank you for using him to reveal to us your great character, your mercy, your love your patience with us, your kindness to us, Lord. And I pray that many people here tonight will seek you this week and follow the example of your servant David and humble themselves before you, get real with you, and trust you with their life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. He was talking, I was thinking, you know, David had this trust in God and his mercy, but he was looking forward.